In this video, I'd like to share my two different workflow approaches for creating a one-to-one -one parody with Impact XT. Okay, so what do I mean by this? I've got an instance of Impact opened up. This is a very basic preset that I created, and I use this preset all the time in writing sessions. We'll have a play. I literally created a an instrument part that was triggering every single pad. So the drum pattern doesn't really make sense, but it's just for the sake of demonstration. And this is a pattern and worth noting that the same principles apply in both of these. Okay, so workflow concept number one. We have an instance of Impact XT. It is sitting on one track. I'm doing all of my sequence on this track. And because all the pads are routed to the same output, we have one channel in our console. For basic sequencing, this is great. It works perfectly. Now, if ever you need more control, as most of you most likely know, we can route these different pads out to different outputs. So we've got 16 stereo outputs and we've got 16 mono outputs. Now, I don't think this is new news to anybody. If you're watching this video, I'm sure you're already aware of this. So this is a really great way to be able to have the simplicity of sequencing on one track, but let me just hop over to my multi-out preset. This is the exact same preset, the exact same kit, the only difference being that I have created an instrument plus effects preset, and I've routed some of these, well, I've routed all of them out to their own discrete outputs, and I've separated them in a way that I want. So I've got all my toms together, I have my hi-hats together here, the symbols are together, they're going out the same output, but essentially if I play this, notice that it's making use of all of these different faders, or rather all of these different channels in the console. Now, full disclosure, if I'm doing something and I'm 100% happy with the drum sequencing that I've done, and we start writing to that and it just works and I like the drum sounds that I've used, there's really no need to make it any more complicated than this. As long as you set up your multi-out channels, we have a really quick and easy way that we can just render this to audio, and that's by going with export stems. So in this case, I'm gonna make sure I go with channels and I'm just selecting all of the drum channels that I want. I'm gonna get rid of the file name prefix. Your format is going to be whatever your song is in. It could be 24, 44, 1, 24, 48, 96, anything that you're working with. Export range is gonna be between the loop and the main important thing here is you wanna make sure that import to track is enabled. When I do this, Studio One is simply going to render out a channel for each one of these. So now we have an audio version of all of these. One thing I like to do because I gain stage so conservatively is I'm gonna turn the event gain up 12 dB and then I'm going to do a trim on our input trims. If you're not seeing these, those are available in your console options, input controls over here. And you have to make sure that your uh, console height is high enough to see them. And this allows me to clearly see on my waveforms. Now, at this point, I wouldn't need to have my MIDI anymore, so I could just right click and I could disable this, and then I could even hide all these tracks. Now I have an audio version. And again, I have my one-to-one, -one, and if at any given point I need to make any changes, that's very, very easy for me to do. I can just go back and reactivate this instrument track over here, right click and I can enable this track and then I could, you know, sequence a bridge or something like that or make any changes that I want to. The other thing I could do is I could just edit my audio, which is something that I will do as well. But anyways, that's the most basic step in terms of having the multi-out control, rendering them as stems and bringing them right back in. Now, that being said, there's also a couple other things that I wanted to focus on in this video. So, more specifically, if you come from other DAWs, you might be used to like a one track in the arrange window and you get one track in the console. That's kind of the whole point of why I wanted to do this video. If we take a look at the way that this works right now, we have one track where we're doing all of our sequencing on and then we have multiple channels. If I select this track in the arrange window, Notice that I have access to the very first channel. It says kick, we can adjust our inserts and we can adjust our sends, but I don't have access to any other one of these channels. So you might say to yourself, oh, no problem. Well, we can just click any one of these and we can just go option A and I'll just keep firing that off. We'll do the first four over here. Uh, but the only problem is we still only have one track. But if I was to expand the envelopes, you'll see that I have volume for all of these over here and you'll notice that 
These are all corresponding. It looks like I missed one of these by accident. These are all corresponding to these different channels. So that is kind of what I need, but the problem is if I select these, notice that it still has the kick track as the one that's selected in the inspector. And a lot of the times, because I work on one main monitor, I will have my console closed and I will have my inspector open. And I do a lot of work this way because it still gives me access to the inserts and the sends. And I can drag and drop from the browser and it's very easy. That being said, let's bring the console back and I'm going to undo these changes and let's get rid of these three. We'll leave this one because this is useful and we will collapse this so we're just looking at the main layer now if we tackle this a slightly different way by again clicking any one of these parameters and you'll see the minute I click that in the top left it says snare volume I'm going to now drag this and notice what it says it says move volume automation from kick to new automation track okay so we're gonna click this I'm gonna click this one now this is my rim shot I'm gonna drag and drop this over and I'm gonna start adjusting each one of these. I'm just clicking and then dragging and dropping, clicking, dragging and dropping. I'm going to click each fader cap and drag and drop. And as you can see, we're almost done here. I got two more. So let's do this one. And last but not least, we have our symbols. I will drag and drop this there. Now, notice that we now have an automation track, which is great because if you wanted to automate anything over here, that's something that we could do easily. But not just that, if we take a look at this over here, notice that as I selected this automation track, in the inspector, the symbols are visible. The symbols is the track over here. Let's select the clav. Notice that this has brought this into focus. And if I use my up and down keys and with my arrange window in focus, notice that each one of these is following. Just to kind of prove this point, let's give these some different colors over here. This one will be these blues. These two over here can be this blue. We'll give this one, we'll go with uh, this. And last but not least, we will go over here. So now you have our kick, our snare, a rim shot, clap. Notice that the channel that we're selecting in the console is also visible in the inspector and the automation tracks are visible here. If ever you are needing to do something where you need to automate the volume, this could be on individual tracks where you're literally drawing nodes, or it could also be something where, for example, you're using a VCA fader and maybe I want to write some VCA automation in here. Notice that everything is following and we have that one-to-one -one parity. Now, I'm gonna be completely honest. If I'm sequencing in MIDI, but I'm not 100% committed to the drum sounds and there's a chance that they may change or I'm writing a song that it's taking a long time and it's one of these situations where you're sitting on something for a week or two trying to write a bridge or a middle eight and you need to still program more drums, if that's the way that I'm working, then this is the way that I set up my session. And the reason I set it up like this is I can pretty much continue to mix this as if though it was audio. Like for example, I could say to myself, okay, well, I want to have an instance of console one on every single one of my drum tracks. So I can just add my one instance of console one across each one of these tracks and I would just start mixing and I would be completely happy to mix like this. And then at the end of the day, I know that I have my export stems option, like we talked about. I can go to channels, and then I go to my kick, and then everything else over here, my snare, rim shot, everything like that. And I, I could do the same thing, and I could bring these back into my actual session. And also, truthfully, there have been cases where I've worked like this, where I have actually left things as MIDI. It doesn't happen often, but it does happen sometimes. Okay. So that's the second use case where I want to leave things as MIDI for the maximum flexibility for the longest period of time. And then if I do end up adding things like different EQs or any different plugins that I'm adding, I have zero issues with just rendering a stereo track and rendering that in. At the end of the day, I will always have these tracks and I can simply deactivate them if needed. There's one more example that I want to get, uh, talk about, but before we do that, let me just remove this VCA channel. So I'm going to remove this and let's take all of these and let's hide and disable them. And actually I should have borrowed my 
MIDI again. So we'll do one more instance. I'm just going to open up my browser and we'll drag a new instance of impact in here. And in this case, I'm going to actually borrow, this has been disabled. That's okay. I'm going to borrow this MIDI one more time because we have one more example. I want to take a look at it. And then I think we're going to call it a day. So the last example is something where if you don't like the workflow, I don't can't imagine why you wouldn't, but if, for example, you don't like the workflow of sequencing on one track and having multi outs available, then let's take a look at something else. I'm going to go to my same preset again here. Actually, let's go to the multi out version. So now I have a multi out instance of each one of these. Again, if I play this, it's going to trigger all the different sounds across all the different channels. But this time we're going to take a slightly different approach. So this is kind of similar, but in this way, we're actually going to have actual tracks which are linked to these channels. Now, full disclosure, I don't work this way ever, but I figured it out. And once I understood that it was an option, um, I thought to myself, I don't know when I would use that, but I just wanted to show it because for some people, this might be what you're interested in doing. We have one instance of this kit over here. It's impact. Now, what I can do is I'm going to right click and I'm going to duplicate the track. It's important, not duplicate complete, but duplicate. And I'm also going to use my shortcut, which I've mapped out. I think this is um, a different keyboard shortcut than the default is. So duplicate track. I need to duplicate this. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. So I need to duplicate this eight more times. And like I said, I'm just going to use my shortcut. So we've got two. I'm going to go three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we got this. All right. So now we have duplicated this track. And the important thing to know is when you duplicate an instrument track, not duplicate complete, that each one of these tracks is sharing the same instrument. If I open any one of these, you'll notice that they are all highlighted. That's because it's the exact same instrument. Now, when we do this type of workflow, there is a way that we can kind of force these tracks to match these channels. Like I said, I don't do this, or I've never actually used it in a session, but it is possible. And the way that we do that is by simply selecting the track in the track header here, opening up the inspector. And notice if I come up here to any one of these tracks, that we can see just above here. You may not see this. You may have to reposition um, some of the spacing between some things over here, but you'll see that we have the channel says kick. So the first one, that is the kick. So that makes sense. Now, these ones over here, if I click down here, these are all of the channels that are being used. So I can actually change the routing of each one of these. So this was snare. This one is going to be rim shot. This one over here, which is set to kick four, Let's go to clap, and this one will be clav, this one will be cowbell, this one will be shaker, this one will be hats, this will be toms, and this will be cymbals. Okay, now the other kind of annoying part is we also have to change the names if we want them to match. So this is going to be snare. And then the next one is going to be rim shot and so on and so forth. All right. So basically what I want to show here, though, is now that we've connected each one of these tracks and we've reset the channel or we've routed this directly to the channel in impact. Also notice that we have a fader in the inspector. We have a track that's selected in the arrange window. We have a console channel that's selected. And also we have the channel and all of the uh, inserts and sends available in the inspector. Now, the thing to note about this is if you wanted to sequence on just one track, you could. Everything is going to play like that. But the other thing that you could do is if you wanted to record these one at a time, that's something that you could also do. So I would just option drag each one of these down. I would still sequence probably on one track if I was ever doing this type of workflow. And then basically I need to just strip out everything else. So I'm going to hold down command. I'm going to click here and then I'm going to use my invert selection. Well, that should be working. Don't know why that's not working usually works. Okay. Um, I'm going to just highlight everything like this then. And we'll go like that. 
And then for this one over here, it's gonna be the same thing again. This one is snare, so like this. Let's try that again, I don't know why it wasn't working. Oh, now it works, okay. Um, maybe a little bug or something like that. Uh, the next one would be rim shot. So again, holding down command or control on a PC, click. I've got a shortcut to invert my selection and then get rid of it. And then basically what this would be doing is it would be putting one instrument part on each track and then you have the ability to basically uh, let everything play and you have one track and one channel. And each one is just recording the snare MIDI on this track, the rim shot MIDI on this track, and so on and so forth. But what you end up getting is one track that equals one channel, right? Now, my only issue with this, like I said, is that it takes too long. I have to do so much renaming. And um, I quite like sequencing on one track and then having multiple channel outs. So I would honestly rather take the approach that we took in the above example, where I'm basically just clicking these faders and dragging and dropping to create automation lanes. Because for me, that's a lot more simple than this um, different approach that we just showed over here. So which one was it? Was it these ones? Yeah. So where where we basically have an automation track that is linked to a channel. That for me is, is a much better workflow than um, basically just having to go into each channel and reassign it just for the sake of having the parity and the connection. But anyways, that is how I deal with working with Impact XT, more specifically um, when I'm doing multi-channel routing. But like I said, at the end of the day, every single time, my end goal is always to have an audio rendered file, even if it has the plugins and everything rendered into it. I always want to archive and by the time I'm mixing, I want things to be audio so that I can manipulate them. And then like I said, you can also do some basic editing if I wanted to change up a kick pattern or add a double or a pickup or something like that. It's very easy to do with audio. Um, and, and this is something that I do all the time. So anyways, that's all the time I have available for today. I hope that you enjoyed this content. If you did, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Any questions or comments, leave them down below. I will do my absolute best to get back to you. And as always, we will catch you in the next video. Cheers.